So as I said earlier, this is one of the high points of the whole church year. This is um, such a festive day. And my hope for today, this is my one hope, is that whether you, this is a new encounter for you. Maybe you're not familiar with Palm Sunday. Maybe you either didn't, weren't in a church that really focused on this, or maybe you didn't grow up in the church. Maybe this is your first time hearing about Jesus. Um, whether that's your story, or whether you've been celebrating Palm Sunday for 80 years, and you've, you remember when there was churches that did like the bigger branches, you know, those were a little bit cooler, and shrinkflation. No, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, just kidding. This is not a political commentary. Um, but uh, whether you have, are new or whether you are a longtime churchgoer, um, Palm Sunday is a special day, and it's a very festive day, and the story we're going to read is a very festive one. And my hope for all of us is as we encounter this story, that we leave here today with a better understanding of where to situate ourselves in this story. Now, there's a danger that comes whenever you just read something in the Bible and say, who am I in this? Sometimes the answer is nobody. Um, at the same time, I think this is an occasion where where you are sitting or standing in this story um, can greatly impact how, this, how you view this next week of Holy Week and how you view the Christian life as a whole. So my hope is as we read this story and as we talk about it, we have a better understanding of where to situate yourself. Where should we be sitting or standing in the story of Palm Sunday? So that's what we're after today. Um, just a little bit of backstory. So in the gospel accounts, in the books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you have Jesus doing all of this ministry. He's teaching, he's healing people, and then at one point he goes to Jerusalem for the final showdown. Right? This is where everything comes to a head, all of the opposition, all of the healing, all the ministry. This is where he's going to do all the things that he, he wants to do in final culmination. And it starts with this entry. Because Jesus doesn't just kind of show up and sneak in the back door, like if you're ever at a party and all of a sudden you're like, oh, when did you get here? That's not Jesus. He's, he's going he's gonna to make an entry. Um, it's going to be a memorable entry. It's going to be one that people um, anticipate, they see coming, they're excited for. Um, and that's what we're looking at today is this entry into the city that's going to set the stage for everything else that we remember in this Holy Week. And so we're going to be looking at the Luke account. So this is the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19, starting in verse 28. All right. And when he had said these things to them, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethphage, Bethphage and Bethany, at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? You shall say this, The Lord has need of it. All right, so he, Jesus gets close to Jerusalem. He's approaching. He, he's kind of seen Jerusalem. He's from a little bit afar. And then he tells some, two of his disciples, he said, all right, here's what you need to do. Go to that village. Go find a colt. Um, it's a colt of a donkey, we'll see, on which nobody's ever sat before, and bring it here. And if anyone says, like, hey, what are you doing taking my donkey? Tell them the Lord has need of it. Um, can you imagine, like, it's a good training and, like, all right, Jesus, I'm going to do what you say. Like, I'm going to be caught red-handed stealing something, you know. Just got to trust Jesus on this one. All right, continuing on. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their, clo their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. So they go, they find the colt. Somebody asks, Hey, why are you taking my colt? And then they say, The Lord has need of it. It works just like Jesus says. And then they put their cloaks, kind of like a, a makeshift saddle, and then they lift Jesus up and they put him on this colt, on this donkey. And then here's the sentry. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. And he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives. The whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. All right, so now here's, here's the scene where he's coming in. He's sitting on this, this colt or this donkey. Um, they're, they're making a way for him. And all of his disciples, all these crowds, this multitude, this whole crowd starts gathering. And they start crying out. Um, Luke doesn't record the word Hosanna. He uses the word blessed. Um, both, were probably, both were said. It's just different gospel writers write different things. So we don't have Hosanna in here. But we have blessed is the king. So they view Jesus as this king who's coming, right? In the name of the Lord. He's bringing peace on heaven, in heaven, and glory in the highest. And then there's opposition. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, 
The very stones would cry out. I love that. So, just to recap, Jesus gets on this donkey. He starts riding in. People are going crazy. Here comes this king, the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, this is awesome. Look what he's done. The Pharisees see him like, hey, Jesus, they shouldn't be saying all this stuff about you. You know, tell them to calm down. And Jesus says, hey, if these people stop crying out, the stones are going to cry out. Somebody needs to be crying out here. This is, this is a big moment. So what I want to focus on today is what this crowd is seeing here. Because if you, you imagine this scene, Jesus walking in, you imagine on the center aisle, and you have people looking on, and on the other side you have, again, palm branches waving and people crying out, this big festive moment, and what they see riding in is this king who's going to save them. Now the question is, what kind of king and what is he saving them from? For these people, this, was, this moment was not an accident. This wasn't just like, oh, cool, he's doing something neat. Um, the people have been looking to make Jesus king for a long time. They love this man, what he had done, um, his disciples, his followers. There were several times he, he sought, they sought to crown him. They wanted to make him ruler. He withdrew. And so this is a big moment because in this moment, it appears that Jesus is crowning himself as king. Because the people, one of the prophecies they'd been waiting for for a long time was recorded in the prophet of Zechariah. In chapter 9, when, when the people are given this word of encouragement of restoration, one day you'll be saved, and this is what Zechariah writes, the word of the Lord, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. These words were words that people held on to. They're waiting for this king to ride into to save them on a donkey. And so when Jesus gets on a donkey, it's not like an accident. Like, oh, that's a cool animal to choose. It's like, oh my gosh, he's doing it, guys. He's the king. He's, 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 he's crowning himself. This is what they've been waiting for. They're freaking out. They're losing it. It's euphoria. Um, all these other words would have come to them. This is still in that same prophecy in Zechariah. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit, Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore to you double. And have all this restoration. It's going to be great. Um, Zechariah continues. He says, Then the Lord will appear over them, and his arrow will go forth like lightning. The Lord God will sound the trumpet and will march forth in the whirlwind, whirlwinds of the south. He closes out in this section. On that day, the Lord their God will save them as the flock of his people's. For like the jewels of a crown, they shall shine on his land. For how great is his goodness, and how great his beauty. Grain shall make the young women flourish, and new wine, new men flourish, and the new wine, the young women. So the people, they've been waiting for this king. This king that's going to come in and save them. And so when Jesus gets on this donkey, they're like, he's the king. It's happening. It's happening. Like, they're freaking out. The problem is, what kind of king do they want? See, from the, from the angle that the crowd is sitting at, they just see this king mounted on a donkey riding into Jerusalem, and they just assume that his path leads to this political kingdom. You see, the people, when they're reading these words, they're not looking for the kind of king Jesus is. They're looking for a king who will help them because currently they're under another government, right? They're under the control of the Romans. The Romans tax them. They hate that. The Romans control them. They tell them what they can and can't do. And so they're thinking, this is the king who's going to make our people the best people. We're no longer going to have an oppressor. We're no longer going to be subject to somebody. We're going to have absolute freedom and power and everything. Back in the days of old, when we, we've heard stories about this, when we were the best of the best and we were the most powerful and the richest, we want that again. This king, he's going to do it for us. So they assume that Jesus is this king who's going to give them this political freedom, this political um, rule, this beautiful crown of power, he's going to set them free. That's the view you get when you're watching Jesus from the side, because all you see is him on a donkey with people cheering. What I would like to, us to think about today is a different angle to watch this procession. Procession is just a, a fancy word for everyone, kind of like a parade, like just going towards something. Um, because there's something very different about watching a procession or a parade versus being in one. So for instance, um, I grew up, I loved parades as a kid, um, especially because I was the oldest sibling, and so I was always the fastest to the candy in my family. So I got the most 
things from all the parades. Um, but I love parades. But it's a very different experience if you've ever been in a parade versus watching one. So when you're watching a parade, you're in a comfy chair, right? Usually a lawn chair. Maybe you have like a soda or something. Um, it's nice and sunny and you just get to wave and, and it's all nice and everything goes by and it's cool. But if you've ever been in a parade, it takes a lot more work, <laughs> right? Because that same nice sun, now you're beating down, you're sweating, you're your limbs are getting sore, your, your feet are tired. And, and the thing about Jesus is that the core of his call, right, when he goes to all of his disciples, what are the, usually the first two words he says to any of his disciples? Follow me. Follow me. So what I want to reflect on today is the difference between watching a procession versus walking in a procession. And again, there's a danger in, in trying to read too much into putting ourselves in the story, but what I find helpful about Palm Sunday is, is, as somebody who has heard this story a lot of times, it is really easy for me just to watch Palm Sunday. Look how cool it is. Oh, I can just imagine all the noise and the camaraderie and, and the fun. It is much different for me to imagine following and getting in line, hearing Jesus' words of follow me, and walking in that procession. See, from the side view, I, I can see a lot of things. I just see Jesus, and, and I can imagine he's going anywhere. Where do I want him to go? Jesus, you're the king. You're the king of... Um, of the, he's the king of the Jews. He's going to be the king of Rome. He's going to be the king of whatever I want him to be. He's going to be the king of uh, my work life, whatever. He's going to be the king of all of that. I can just fill in the blank because all I see is the side view of Jesus. But what happens is when you fall in line and you follow Jesus, you can see where the procession leads. It becomes, it becomes less obscure because for Jesus, this procession, as triumphant and joyous as it was, it was not one that led to the capital, right? <laughs> they didn't they didn't go to, to Rome to go throw an insurrection in, in this political landscape. What they did is they turned and he saw the cross. Ultimately, this procession that Jesus is in, for all of it, it was not about the kind of revolt that the people of Jesus' day wanted. He was not their king. It was a king who rode a donkey because no king in their glory would ever ride a donkey. He was a king who wasn't set towards wherever Pontius Pilate was, was at at the time, the one who ruled over them, but rather set towards the temple first, where God's people dwelt, and then over and over to a cross where he would die. See, this procession that Jesus did is a procession that is not as glorious as we like to think. Because it's a, it's a beautiful occasion, but the people completely missed what he was doing because they were so focused on the kind of king that they wanted. This is the kind of ruler we want. This is the kind of guy we want who's going to stick it to those Romans. He's going to stick it to all the people who have an issue with us, and he's going to make us powerful. And Jesus instead said, I'm going to empty myself of all my power. And it's, it's, it's a humbling experience. See, and this is where, again, if you're watching the procession, you're, it's comfy. Yeah, Jesus, go get him. Go do it. If you're going to follow him, well, then your feet are going to get sore. Then your limbs are going to get tired. Then you're going to start sweating. But it's the path that ultimately he walked because he was not the king that they wanted. He's the king that, he, that they needed. And Jesus isn't always the king that we want, but he's always the king that we need. And so when you see Palm Sunday, it, it's easy to look at all the fanfare and the festivities. And again, I, I love the palm branches, and this is good. That's why we do it. But we're not celebrating somebody who's going to go and stick it to anybody. We're celebrating somebody who's going to go and give up himself. So for instance, the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 2 says it this way. He talks about Christ Jesus. He says, Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself gave up everything from himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by being obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So Jesus, though he, he was, he's true God, right? We confess that in the Nicene Creed. God of God, light of God, very God of very God. He's God. He was not going to come and just exert his godliness. Instead, he took on the form of a servant. So Paul says, because Jesus, the one who did that for you, he says in Philippians 2, here's what you do. Here's what it means to follow him on that same procession. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. 
Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. What Paul is saying is Jesus did not come to exalt over people. He came in humility. And Jesus' whole ministry can be summed up by counting others as more significant than himself. himself. He saw you and said, you're more important than me. And so what does it take to save you? It takes me dying? Okay. He's not only looking to his own interest. What would his interest be? Well, if you know that there's a city where there's a bunch of people who want to kill you, if you were looking out for only your own interest, don't go to that city. <laughs> and don't make a big fanfare, right? The Pharisees who did not like Jesus, they saw him too, right? They heard the people crying out. He made his presence known. Jesus did not look out for his own interest, but he looked out for your interest. He looked out for the interest of the people who, who hated him, who revolted him, who told him, I hate tell your people to be quiet, stop all this. And so for us to look at Palm Sunday as walking in a procession versus just watching, it means that we look at this next week of Jesus' life and we're not just passively saying, go Jesus, go, I'm going to get back to what my regular programming or Hey, there he went by, all right, what's the next float? But it's saying, all right, if this is the way Jesus is going, I'm going to follow in his footsteps. I'm going to, I'm going to get in line like a good soldier. I'm going to march with him. So if Jesus' path then, if this procession is one of humility, if it's one of not counting himself as more important, that means the same is for us. To follow Jesus, to, to take those words seriously and to join in this procession is to walk a life where you look at the people around you as more important and significant than yourself. That boss that drives you up a wall, the path of Jesus is to say, they're more significant than me. How can I treat them that way? So when you have, when you have a family member, whether it's a spouse or a sibling, and they just get on your nerves, it's saying, how can I look after their interests and not just my own? How can I make sure that this relationship is not just for me, but it's actually so I can give myself for them? If Jesus emptied himself of everything, if he was willing to give his life for us, how can I use my life for those around me? How can I look at this, this world, this next week, this, my whole life, as not just something to be um, like money in my pocket, like this is great, I can spend on whatever I want, but this is a gift, and if Jesus was here, how would he spend this time? How would he spend this life? Now there's a distinction to be made because you are not Jesus. <laughs> Right? There's a point where there are people who follow Jesus in this procession, and there's a point where they have to stand back. Because what he does, they can't do. And his final followers, the only ones who don't leave him, when he goes to that cross, they have to stand back and watch. They can't follow him to that cross because that's for him to do. It's something that only he could have done. You or I, we never had the strength. These, these sinful legs could have never carried me there. And so eventually, Jesus, this path, this procession leads him to go on trial. It leads him to, to carry a cross as his body's giving out. And it leads him to be crucified. And his disciples have to stand back and watch at that moment. But then the procession doesn't stop, right? The music starts playing again. And on the third day, Jesus rose from the dead. And he said, all right, let's keep going. The path's not done. And I do want to say that there's a difference between looking to Jesus and, and just watching. So, for instance, in Hebrews, we're told to fix our eyes upon Jesus. Jesus is, is, is the only hope of our salvation. There's no amount of, of humility or service that could ever make me righteous in God's eyes. I can't do it. I'm always going to veer off, and I'm always going to choose the easy chair. And yet, when Hebrews talks about fixing our eyes on Jesus, though, he says, run the race. So we are people who are constantly on the move, but looking forward to the one who's leading the procession. Jesus is the one who's going on ahead. He's the one who has walked a life of humility. He is now exalted, and he continues to serve and to bless. And so we get to follow in those footsteps. We are running. It is tiresome. It is work. But it is worth it. And so Palm Sunday is about looking to this king, who is not a king who says, ah, oh, glorify me, but rather a king who says, let me wash your feet on Monday, Thursday. A king who says, let me die for you on Good Friday. And a king who says, take eternal life from me on Easter. And we follow that king in this procession, not because it's easy, but because in doing it, we end up where he ends up. We end up 
and the same eternal life. We get to, to share in all of his goodness, all of his gifts on that last day. I want to highlight this. So here at Renewal Church and our sister campus, St. John's, we have a, a mission statement um, that kind of just summarizes who we are as a congregation. Um, this is something that we'll refer to it from time to time. It's, it's who we are, but our mission is in the midst of distraction and misplaced hope. We walk together toward a renewed hope and life in Jesus Christ. I love this because it highlights that we are walking. We are going somewhere. We are on a journey, and as I said, you ever gone on a really long walk? It's tiresome at times. It's not always easy. Falling into the procession of Jesus is not as comfortable as just sitting in a chair and watching Jesus from afar. One of the temptations of the whole Christian life is just watching Jesus. Hey, Jesus, I'm glad you're doing all that stuff. I'm going to get back to the other action. But the call to follow him in all humility, to look around at how has Jesus called me to, to lower myself, to exalt others. It's walking. It's tiresome. I'm going to get exhausted. I might get sweaty. But we're walking together. And the good news of Jesus is that all of this, this renewed hope in life, is already yours. But it's also somewhere we're going. So it's yours now. As you walk, you have this life. You have this hope. And eventually we're going to get to the destination and we're going to get it all the fuller. But in the meantime, we walk hand in hand. And so when one of us falls, we reach over and we pick that person up. When one of us gets distracted and, and wants to go sit on the sidelines for a little while, we go, we go over to them and we lend them a hand and let them lean on us for a little bit. But this procession, this glorious parade that Jesus walks, it's going to lead to dying to ourselves it's going to lead to, in a way, death like Jesus experienced, and yet it's going to lead to life. It's going to lead to hope. So brothers and sisters, as we go through this Holy Week, I just encourage you to make this week especially a, a week where you ask yourself, how can I follow? How can I get in that procession? How can I not just stand back and watch Jesus do his thing, but how can I fix my eyes upon him and run that race? Who are the people around me that Jesus has called me to lift up and humble myself to? Who are those people that Jesus has called? Look after their interests, not just your own. Invite them in this procession. Invite them in this parade because where this is going is an empty tomb and eternal life. What a glorious parade. And on that day, there's going to be trumpets. There's going to be all sorts of things. Maybe we'll even have palms with all the branches. I don't know. I like to imagine. But that's where we're going. And again, it's not easy. It's tiresome. It's hard. But I promise you this, it's worth it. Because Jesus is the one who is willing to do whatever it takes because he thought you were worth it. He was willing to die, he was willing to rise. So brothers and sisters, this holy week, look around, join the procession, and let's get walking. In Jesus' name, amen.